Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Mary stayed outside the tomb weeping and as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken my Lord and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener and she said to him, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you laid him and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Raboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and then reported what he told her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your family, the, the focus of today is on a shepherd's duty, sacred cows, and assumptions. Firstly, it is the duty of every shepherd to preach the hard application of the truths of our faith, faith to reality. The reality we see that we face every day, the particular uh, challenges of our time, all the more so in desperate times. For as the saying goes, as we've meditated upon a couple times, I think, in the last week, desperate times call for desperate measures. Desperate times call for leaders to take desperate measures, such, such as cutting through the platitudes and the pablum, returning to the fundamental truths of our faith. And as Moses put it so well in the Shema Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. If, if every shepherd of Holy Mother Church said those words every single day, maybe... Maybe the people would get their head on straight. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And him is our refuge. That's why Moses continued, therefore you shall love the Lord, your God, with your whole heart, not some of it, all of it, with your whole being, with your whole strength. Take to heart these words I command you today. Keep repeating them to your children. Keep repeating them to your children, Moses said. Other translations are drill them into your children. Now, dear family, you, you are my children. So if I sound redundant from time to time, blame Moses. I'm supposed to drill it into you. Which brings us to the second point, sacred cows. Some people have complained that I've been... That I've been too strident, too political, too critical of some in the hierarchy to fill in the blank with the blank being their sacred cow. Well, as an aside, you will know the genuineness of people's professed faith by the response you get when you, re when you reveal the flaw of their sacred cow. Now, Jesus revealed the flaw of the Jewish leaders, many sacred cows, and we saw the genuineness of their faith on Calvary. In a more particular and personal way, Jesus revealed the flaw of Judas's sacred cow 
And we actually can measure, actually can measure the genuineness of Judas's faith in silver pieces, 30 of them. Judas' sacred cow was he wanted a Messiah of his own choosing. Remember how Peter, James, and John all thought the Messiah was going to be this conquering hero. Thus, when Jesus specifically told them he must suffer and die, Peter, first among all the other apostles, was a bit upset because that was not the sacred cow he was looking for, not the Messiah he was looking for. He took Jesus aside, Jesus aside and the word in sacred scripture in the gospel is rebuked him. I just, it's kind of funny to think anybody's going to rebuke Jesus, but although we do it all the time, why, Lord, why? You're not quite making sure that I'm not suffering. You're not changing the world to suit my preferences. We rebuke Jesus just like Peter did. Good, God forbid, Lord, no such thing will ever happen to you. God forbid, Lord, that this is happening to me. How's that any different from Peter? Remember how Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. In other words, follow me. And St. Peter did. He gave up his sacred cow and followed Jesus. And when James and John had essentially the same sacred cow going, they too thought the Messiah was going to be this conquering hero, a worldly ruler. So that's why they approached Jesus. Hey, we want to sit on your right and your left. Remember how Jesus said those seats were not his to give. But he did ask James and John, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? At least Peter, James, and John spoke directly to Jesus about their sacred cow, what they considered to be the role of the Messiah. At least they talked to Jesus. Jesus corrected them. They started to follow Jesus again. They got slightly off the narrow path. He brought him back. Judas, on the other hand, did not. Judas decided to take matters into his own hands, to force Jesus' hand, and rather conveniently scored 30 pieces of silver in the process. The point is, like it was for Peter, James, and John, or like it was differently for Judas, you won't know the genuineness of people's professed faith. You will know the, the genuineness of people's professed faith by the response you get when you reveal the flaw of their sacred cows. And that reveal, that revelation, will be found either in their humility to get behind Jesus and follow him, like Peter, James, and John, or in their pride, like Judas, who betrayed him. For Peter, James, and John, their humility allowed all three of them to get behind Jesus and follow him. For Judas, his pride compelled him to betray Jesus, and we know the consequences for that, because Jesus himself put it best. The son of man indeed goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. But your family, desperate times call for desperate measures. And short of the last century of world wars and threats of world wars, I cannot think of a more desperate time, a time when mere platitudes and pablum are not sufficient to lead the truly faithful unto eternal salvation. So as to the complainers out there complaining about their sacred cows, I guess I can say this, get a life. Nobody but nobody is asking you to tune in and watch. If you don't like the truth spoken, go find your daily fix of platitudes and plabum elsewhere. The truth is that there are countless number of faithful, countless number that are starving for the truth, are craving for the truth, are craving to be fed, are craving to be led in these desperate times. And if you think about how pridefully arrogant are the complainers, who would deny that legitimate constituency of a flock who wants to hear the voice of truth. How pridefully arrogant are the complainers because it offends the complainer's sacred cow and they want to deny the, the people who want to hear the truth spoken boldly, spoken clearly, want to deny them that. Which brings us to the third point, assumptions. There's that 
There's that really funny phrase about the word assume, what it really means. I won't repeat it in this sacred sanctuary because Jesus really is present. Well, if I personally am guilty of anything, dear family, it's that I make assumptions. For example, I assume that you already know the basics of the faith. I could preach and only teach the basics of our faith, but the flock who already knows the basics don't need a shepherd who only drills them in the basics because you're a bit more than a child in the faith. You're an adult in the faith. That's an assumption I make. Perhaps I'm wrong. Remember the shame of Israel talked about drilling the basics into children, not into adults. So I've made the assumption, I assume, that you already know the faith. And then you just want to know how to apply it to the world around us, especially during such desperate times. Ironically, as you know, in seminary, we were repeatedly, we repeatedly were told seven minutes, seven minutes, seven minutes. That's all the time we get for teaching the faith during the liturgy of the word for applying the faith to real life. That's impossible. Seven minutes, absolutely impossible. That only is enough time to spout off one question and answer from the Baltimore Catechism. It's only time to, to continue reciting the words prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Okay, let's have some explanation about that, how that applies to our world today in these desperate times. Seven minutes is not enough time to ponder eternal verities applied to the desperate times of our day. When the desperate times have rent the hearts of the faithful, when the assaults upon our faith from outside and even inside the church, I, maybe you've seen it, that horror. I, I don't know. I don't know if I've actually seen with my own eyes a greater sacrilege against the Holy Eucharist than that little video of, I think it's called Pax Christi, the church, where they were putting, they were suggesting they were going to do it. I, I hope to God they never did it, not even once putting the consecrated host in plastic sandwich bags on a table in the back for people to grab and grow, grab and go. I, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen or even heard of so great a sacrilege in all my years. How, how any ordained clergy could even begin to think, could even begin to dream up something so sacrilegious is absolutely beyond me. If anybody needs to go back to training school, it's a, it's a clergy who would think it's okay to put a consecrated host in a plastic sandwich bag to grab and go. Sacrilege. What is it? What does our church come to? How is it that anyone thinks that's an okay idea? These desperate times have rent the hearts of the faithful who look upon something so ridiculous. The assaults upon our faith are from outside, but certainly inside the church. They've left the truly faithful wallowing in bewilderment and unnerved them in the face of challenges. What are we supposed to do? Let's get some leadership. Let's show us what to do. Let's tell us what to do. It's going to take more than seven minutes to guide them, to shepherd them down the narrow road. Just have the picture in your mind. When the wolves in sheep's clothing attack the flock on the road, the sheep want to scatter. It's a hard job indeed to fulfill the duty of the shepherd to protect the sheep from those wolves. There's so many of them in so many ways, acting like wolves, to keep the, to keep the sheep from scattering, to keep them on the narrow road. Not a simple task. And obviously, we, haven't, we shepherds haven't done such a great job of it when, you know, you, the proof is in the pudding that 75%. A baptized Catholics no longer come to Mass. I've said that several times. It's a staggering number. It still staggers me. I can't understand it. I can't believe it, but it's true. And now 74%, it keeps growing. 74% no longer believe in the real presence. How can they? I mean, after all, if it's good enough to maybe, to maybe bother to tune into TV, so I, to, to watch, if they even bothered, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So I don't even have to get dressed up in my Sunday best. You know, watch the incrementalism of it. You know, before, when we were growing up, you, you put on your Sunday best, which you then took off when you got home, so you didn't 
rip your, the, the knees out of your good clothes. Put on your Sunday best and you surely were at Holy Mass. You attended the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. All of a sudden, now we have dressed down everything. And now we don't even have to get dressed up to go to church. Even in our not Sunday best, we can lounge around in sweatpants on the couch and watch it. If we even bother to do that. Doze on the couch during Holy Mass. And it's good enough to see someone receive Holy Communion on TV. It's good enough to, for me to make a spiritual communion. Well, I don't even have to go to church for that now, do I? Eh, spiritual communion. We cannot be surprised that the sheep readily have concluded that attendance, actual attendance, being present at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and reception, actual reception of the Holy Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, is no longer essential. Dear family, attendance... At, holy, at the holy sacrifice of the mass and reception of the holy Eucharist is essential. That actually should be a blinking neon sign on the outside of every single Catholic church around the globe. Attendance at the holy sacrifice of the mass and reception of the holy Eucharist in a sacred and profound way is essential to our faith. That's especially more true now than ever, now in these desperate times when the wolves... The wolves have been released, and it is never more apparent that they are prowling about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. So, their family, at least you know, you know the assumption I make when preparing to preach and teach and guide you along the narrow road in these desperate times, desperate times when the Russian error actually has spread and is alive and well and flourishing as we see every day in every single city where the rioting and looting and the burning continues apace. And to all that, to all that, it came to me this morning to add another word, shooting. Your family is the rioting and looting, the burning and shooting continues apace. I'm making the assumption that you both want and need clarity of catechetical truth, something more than merely clinging to a false sense of the Messiah, like Peter, James, and John did, but then came to the light of Christ, like Mary Magdalene did. In the gospel today, but then also came to the light of Christ. Don't cling to me, Mary, Jesus said. Don't cling to my humanity. Instead, let me ascend into heaven, whereupon I can sit at the right hand of the Father. And I may send down upon you the Holy Spirit. I'll send that Holy Spirit down upon the hearts of my priests so that they can consecrate my body and blood soul and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. The priest calls down in the Epiclesis that same Holy Spirit, I'm going to send Mary, but I got to go. Don't cling to my humanity. Your family, countless views on the websites confirm that truth is spoken and the sheep are being led, the sheep are being fed. So maybe my assumption about what should be said isn't off the mark after all, so let us conclude then by allowing me to thank you, truly thank you, you who continue to show up every day after three years. If the truth wasn't being spoken, you wouldn't be here. Let me thank you, truly thank you, because what so many of you have said to me is exactly what I would say to you. We're not alone and we're not crazy. These are desperate times. So let us strive as hard as we can together, together to build our spiritual arcs so we can rise above the errors of these times so that we can fill our lamps with oil so we can be a light of truth amidst these desperate times. Because, dear family, 75% of Catholics need to see our light. 74% who don't believe in the Holy Eucharist need to see that we do and we insist upon coming to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass to receive it. That's how we can be a witness of faith, to stand up and speak out for that truth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.